Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is about planning the electrics for the steel trawler and it's proudly sponsored by marineengine.com. So finally getting around to it, I'm gonna sit down and just show you guys what I'm thinking I'm gonna do with regards to rewiring the boat. This video, I've got to admit now, is gonna be a bit of a talk fest, just showing you my plans, drawing them out in a bit of paper, showing you the equipment I've got. I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, so I'll put a link in the corner to an older video I did just touring around the river. It's one of those videos from before when I started the trawler, so I know a lot of you guys who are newer to the channel haven't seen that video, and I just thought it might give you an idea of what the area's like, a bit more of an idea anyway, and a bit of a send-off to the green machine given it was filmed all from the boat. Before we get going with this video, I've got to say a big thanks to Red Ark, who sent me one of their wonderful, clever DC-DC chargers. And this unit, which we'll unpack in a minute, haven't even opened it yet, is really kind of going to be at the heart of this charging circuit. It solves a whole lot of problems for me, so I'll go back a little bit of a few steps and tell you how I discovered this unit, uh, and then we'll talk about the problems it solved, and then what we're going to need to add on top of that to have a full electrical circuit. All right, let's start with a bit of a diagram of what we used to have in the boat. The, the way I got onto this charger actually was that I was down at Hornsby Auto Electrics doing a car job uh, for the workshop, the old workshop, and I said, oh look, while I'm here, can I pick your brains? I've got a boat, it's got two 12 volt batteries, and they're connected in series, and I've got a 24 volt alternator and a 24 volt starter motor. This all charges fine, but the rest of the 12 volt electrics on the boat just came off one battery like this, which is a really, really bad idea. And that's actually when it was Chris who said to me, he took me over to a Red Ark poster and said, you need one of these. He said, this will solve all that kind of problem and do it correctly. There are two ways to do this. One is to run a second alternator, to run a 12 volt alternator off a second belt. Look, there are definitely advantages to that setup too, but this solved even more problems than that again. So I think it's gonna be a really elegant solution to the problem in this trawler. What have we got here? Uh, I think there's some crimp and some heat shrink they give you. There we go. Shame nothing sticks to this polyboard. <laughs> so look, I'm gonna to have to read through this, but I'm gonna to talk to you about this unit with regards to my basic understanding of what it's gonna do for me. One of the great things about Red Ark that I've been hearing you know, all over the net is that they're really good at sort of aftermarket support. So I'll definitely be getting onto these guys with some questions down the track. All right, let's start with just a rough drawing of the boat from above. So, and we'll talk about batteries. We've got the lazaret here. We've got the engine bay about here. We've got the front cabin here and the anchor well here. So these are my main sort of four compartments in the boat. Now, there's gonna be a shelf about here in the engine bay, which is where the batteries were originally. And here I've got three house batteries, which are AGM 130 amp batteries and two large starting batteries. These house batteries will be in parallel to be my 12 volt system. These two large starting batteries are in series to be my 24 volt system. Then what happens with the Red Arc charger is that we have our charger, which we mounted on one of these boards. The alternator from the engine sends 24 volts into this unit. This unit can then charge this 24 volt system and this 12 volt system. On top of that, I also have a solar panel array that I'm gonna be putting on the roof, which is actually a total of 900 watts of solar that I also got through Red Arc. This is a 12 volt solar array and it comes into the Red Arc unit. It can charge my 12 volt house batteries and my 24 volt starting batteries as well. Also, if the engine's running and it's a bright sunny day, this charger will actually take a bit of load off the alternator to save fuel because it has a bit of a sort of prefer green energy sort of software in it that says, right, if we're getting plenty of current from the solar cell, let's not worry about the alternator. Let's just 
charge using solar, then if the power cuts off, you know, gets cloudy, it's night, and the engine's running, we'll favor the alternator. So this is really gonna be the hub of all my charging on the boat. It also does other things. So really what you're looking at is a DC-DC transformer between 12 and 24 volts, a charge controller for the solar cell. It acts as a charge controller. You have unregulated solar coming into this unit. It also acts as like a voltage sensitive relay to stop the two banks ever draining each other. So this one little unit replaces quite a lot of separate components. And because they're all built into one box, that was designed as a unit, they coordinate much better than all those individual components would do. A separate solar charger, a separate VSR, a separate DC-DC transformer. So that's why I think this is gonna be really awesome for this system. Now, I also have a petrol generator that I may keep on the boat. It's not gonna be a built-in you know, gen set. It's not gonna have plumbed exhaust and all that kind of thing, not at this stage anyway. But I think it'll be really good in the early stages of continuing to work on the boat when it's on the mooring because it'll let me run 240 volt power tools comfortably on the boat. Whether I need it, I don't know, we'll see. I think 900 watts of solar and the new alternator is probably going to be enough for me to run a boat of this size. I'm also going to be keeping the petrol air compressor on the boat. I think that's going to be a really important part of a lot of the sort of salvage work I want to do with the boat. So that's going to give us quite a range of air tools as well. That means we don't even need 240 volt power for that. You can buy just about every tool as an air tool, which will work above and below water. All right, now I'll show you what I'm thinking with regards to the anchor winch. Anchor winches do draw quite a bit of power and it's obviously going to be mounted right up here in the bow. What I've seen recommended and I've seen installed on quite a few boats is actually, in this case, it'll be a sixth battery, but it's a battery purely for running the winch. It means that instead of having very expensive thick cables running all the way to the back of the boat, you can have shorter, slightly thinner, still quite thick, but slightly thinner cables running straight to the battery and then some lighter cable for charging that. I've got a few options. You know, run some sort of charger off here that charges this, I don't know. I'm sure there's a simple way. I haven't really thought about it to be honest with you. Another option is simply on the wheelhouse to have a little solar cell, be constantly trickle charging this battery that does nothing other than run the winch. That is a possibility. Whether this solar is going to keep up, you know, you lift and drop your anchor twice a day, that's actually quite a bit of current. I don't know, so I've got a bit of math to do on that, but I am thinking a separate battery for the winch in the old anchor well. Mounted in the anchor well because the winch I'm putting in is a drum winch, so instead of the anchor chain going into the well, it's actually gonna wind onto the drum that'll be above deck. So that space will be available for that battery to go into. Now we've got that, let's talk a bit about what would go perhaps on this first board. Before I was talking about uh, having the two boards themed and I was thinking maybe having uh, sort of power in and power out. I'm actually changing my mind now and thinking maybe one side AC, one side DC. I think that's actually gonna make a lot of sense. My plan with this boat, is to favor DC electronics wherever I can. AC is a great system for transporting electricity efficiently long distances. AC is good for that, as well as high voltages is good for that. But this is a pretty small boat, 30 foot boat. The batteries are all in the center of the boat and so is the wheelhouse, the accommodation. You know, this power is really gonna go no more than 10, 15 feet max. So. I think running as many 12 volt appliances as possible is the way I'd like to go. You know, 12 volt TV, 12 volt lighting. Uh, even looking these days, you look at things like laptops. Uh, my Mac charges from a USB-C charger and I'd be very surprised if you couldn't find a 12 volt USB-C charger that puts out enough current to charge a MacBook. So instead of going 12 volt, 240, back to five, or whatever USB-C is, I don't know. Um, to me, it makes sense. I also believe with AC, you have to get it really right, particularly in a boat, uh, because there's a lot of potential to do damage to a boat, a steel hull, if you get it wrong. That's not to say you don't just do it right once and you're kind of fine, so that's not really an issue, but I am going to try and keep as much DC 12 volt as I can. That said, let's have a look then at the DC board and what it will start to look like. All right, 
Now if we start planning this board out, the first thing I want to do is just have a positive and a negative terminal coming from a battery so that you're really just moving those battery terminals onto the board. Not a long distance, about a foot, and then from here we're going to branch off. Now we're going to have the loads where we're drawing current and the red arc charger where we're putting current back in and they both need to be fused. So from here we're going to branch off once to a fuse, twice to a fuse. The fuses Red Arc supplied with this kit are 60 amp fuses and the fuses themselves look like that. I don't have the two post terminals I'm going to have here but they'll come in here and then the positive will go, actually I'll make my positive here, the positive will go to these two fuses. Then the negative is going to come over to a negative bus bar. This is a Blue Sea Systems fuse box I've had for quite a while, floating around. But then our negative can come up to the top here. This becomes our negative bus bar. Then our positive, once it's been through one of these fuses, comes to the positive here. And then we can run off to various devices here and have them fused independently. Then we need the brown wire from the red arc unit, which is going to be our charge current which will go through a separate fuse. So this is our input fuse, this is our output fuse. Then this will go back to the positive terminal here and allow us to charge our house battery. The red wire then goes off to our starting battery bank, which is charged by the 24 volt alternator. Then the yellow is the feed from the solar. All right, so let's just draw this up quickly on a bit of paper. All right, then what we end up with is this setup. Our main two terminal posts coming in from the house batteries 60 amp fuse going up to this fuse box, 60 amp fuse going to the charge output of the red arc unit. Then we've got a negative going to the negative bus bar on this fuse block. Then if you consider this line the end of this board, so this is external stuff here, we've got the yellow going to the solar cells on the roof and the red going to the 24 volt battery bank that then is charged by the alternator. I believe this means we can draw 24 volt current from the starting batteries in the alternator to charge the 12 volt system which is over here and that we can also use the 12 volt solar cells backwards to feed the 24 volt system. That's my understanding but I've got to do a bit more reading to confirm it. Now the final thick wire we have coming from the red arc unit is the black wire which is a negative so really we just need to come back here then also there's obviously a negative wire that has to come back from the solar cell as well across to here. So I think this will get us kind of up and running. Then what I want to do is have some quite heavy gauge wires that run from this little fuse box up into the cabin. I like the simple little fuse box in the engine bay because it's pretty robust and the idea is you're not going to be down there replacing fuses all the time. So what I'm going to do is run some heavy gauge wires. There's some really good uh, applications on the web to help you calculate your distance, your voltage, and your acceptable voltage drop so you know what gauge wires to use, and I'll definitely be looking all that up. Then I'm going to run a pair of heavy gauge wires to the front of the boat and go to probably some sort of circuit breaker board. I've seen some really nice ones. Once again, Blue Sea Systems make a really nice one, but they are quite expensive but they also give you a little bit of monitoring of your current draw, your battery health, all that kind of stuff, which is pretty cool to have there in the wheelhouse. From there, I will go off to a switch panel. So the idea is the circuit breakers kind of stay on most of the time and that you switch devices on and off using regular switches because the circuit breakers can arc a little bit. It's, they're not designed to be switches. It's really tempting because you've got these beautiful labeled switches, everything's there and you go, oh, I'll just turn my nav lights on, but it's kind of not what they're for. So. I will have obviously one circuit breaker, say for lighting, um, maybe one for nav lighting, one for internal lighting, and then your switches will work in a more detailed mode. Do I want my anchor light on? Do I want my stern light, my masthead light on, etc. Most of the devices in the wheelhouse are relatively low current devices. There's three, there's going to be three main high current devices so far in the boat. It's going to be the winch on the crane on the back deck, which is relatively close to the house batteries. There's going to be the anchor winch 
and then there's the starter motor on the engine. They're my three main high current items. All those will kind of go directly to batteries, obviously. Then in the engine bay, I'm going to have some need for power. Things like bilge pumps. That's why I've actually got this particular unit. This isn't designed to run everything on the boat at all. That's what the circuit breaker panel is going to do in the wheelhouse because that's where the bulk of the electronics and electrics are. All the lights, nav lights, are attached to the wheelhouse. Uh, you've got going to have you know your sat nav, you're going to have your sounder, you're going to have radios, all that kind of stuff. In the engine bay, I will have stuff that I want connected as directly as possible. You do want your bilge pumps fused because better to have a leaking boat than a boat that's on fire. I think, uh, I was actually watching a documentary the other day and they said the, the main three reasons a boat has a problem is capsizing, uh, collision and fire. They're the three main reasons for a catastrophic loss. So I think really you've got to put no fires at the top of your criteria for installing electrics. It's sort of got to be number one. It, having a particular device not work is nowhere near as bad as having a fire. I guess I'd put criteria number two as no electrolysis, no stray current causing the hull to disappear. I can live with, you know, nav lights that aren't working, have a flashlight on board, see it didn't say torch, just for you guys, and uh, you know, you can get away with that. It's hydraulic steering, you can still steer the boat, there's a manual shut off, you know, like th there's all ways around this, but if your hull's being eaten away, once again, you're in big trouble. Obviously, there are a lot of sensors that go on in engines, so we've got the kind of the 12 volt system for powering things, then we've got all our sensor runs, so I'm going to try and run a good multi-core cable from the engine bay to the wheelhouse for all our temperature, oil pressure, taco, all those kind of sensors. People have often said to me, oh, you know, you've come this far, why keep any of the wiring? And I actually agree 100%. I don't know where all these wires go, they just go everywhere and they are a bit of a mess. I'm not going to rip it all out, there's certain wiring that I think is done really well and it's non-critical stuff, just lights in the cabins, you know, there's actually lights in the engine bay, lazarette and the cabin and they all work. So no reason to rip that out, it's all in good PVC conduit, it's all clipped to the bulkhead or to the deckhead, like there's, there's no problems with it. But I really would like to start as much from scratch as I can, so I'll be pulling a lot of wires out and using that opportunity to feed fresh tinned copper wire, marine wire through as I do that. So they'll also be my sort of draw cables. One other thing probably worth mentioning, and this is something I really need to get my head around more, is your earths on a boat. The advice I've been given is run negatives all the way to a common point and then have one single wire that goes from the negative bus bar to the hull. You've either got a bonded electrical system or an unbonded system. An unbonded system is where none of the electrics, the earths, ever touch the hull anywhere, and it's very, very hard to achieve. A lot of commercial aluminium boats, I think, strive for this, and you have to constantly test and validate it to make sure you haven't just put a single screw through and caused, you know, a second path to ground. I'm going to go with this single point of an earth connection to the hull itself, but all the devices will have a much lower path of resistance connection directly back to battery negative. This apparently is very important for things like the sonar, where signals can get a little bit distorted, you get some noise in the signal, and it can really affect the performance of the sonar, and that's something I'd like to be working as well as I can get it. So I've definitely got a bit to learn there. There are multiple Earths. You have like a, an RF Earth, a... Uh, a lightning strike earth, a DC earth, a uh, AC earth, all these kinds of things. So I figure I'll attack the basic DC circuit as best I can, as I understand it, and then we'll get some extra advice as we move on to some more sort of esoteric elements. I think lightning strike makes sense. Really, it's from the mast and a direct path down to the keel so it doesn't try and go around the boat. You know, it'll actually go in a straight line, whether there's cable there or not, so you may as well put a cable. That's my understanding anyway. And as I said, with the AC, I'm a little bit more gun shy about the AC, so I'll definitely be getting some expert advice on that side. All right, well, I think that's about all I can say about this at the moment. Um, sorry, I was kind of thinking about this as I was going. I didn't really prepare this, so you've really just seen me think out loud. I'm mostly interested in hearing thoughts on the design at this stage. I 
everyone's got some good advice about how to make good connections, etc., etc. But I think we'll focus more on that when we come to do the actual installation. I think if I get the design right now, we focus on the design, we can always talk about, you know, crimp connectors, crimp tools, mechanical protection, all that kind of stuff when we come to actually do the install. All right, well, take care. I'm going to be heading off to Bundaberg in the next couple of days. I'll be filming the trip as we go, you know, we'll film a bit of the road trip and definitely be filming with Damien Jess when we get up there. So there'll be a video before I get back, don't worry about that. And then when I do get back, we'll get stuck into this. All right, well, take care and I'll catch you then. See ya.